What is your full name? My full name in, in, in America is Joseph Samuels. But uh, when I was when in Baghdad, where I grew up, was Yusuf, which is equivalent of Joseph. And uh, there they go by the father's first name. So my name was Yusuf Sasson, or now Joseph Sasson, but the family name was Samuels or Shemuel. And then when I, uh, you know, for to have a full name, it's called Joseph Samuels. So now I, for the last 57 years, I'm Joseph Samuels. Excellent. So may I call you Joseph? Joe, Joseph. Joseph, okay, excellent. How old are you, Joe? I'm 78. Wow, looking good. So what city and country were you born in? I was born in Baghdad, 1930. Okay, great. Um, and tell me a little bit about your genealogy. What's your father's name? Where was he born? What did he do? My father was uh, was born in Baghdad, and so is his his uh, grandfather, his father. Uh, it's uh, the Jews of Baghdad uh, trace their ancestry to the first destruction of the temple, 586 BC. So uh, I, I, I cannot trace them all that that far, but they were born in Baghdad before it was Mesopotamia or Babylonia, and the whole family was lived in Baghdad in, in Iraq. Great. What did your father do growing up when you grew up? Uh, when I grew up, we lived in the old city of Baghdad. Mm -hmm. uh, the family's financial situation wasn't uh, as good as later on. Uh, the old city of Baghdad had the, uh, you know, there was narrow lanes, twisted street, unpaved, mm -hmm. and I was born at home. Uh, there was no cars coming in. The, the only mode of transportation is walking or riding a donkey in the old city. Yeah, so uh, I grew up there, and uh, I lived there till about 10 years old, 10, year, till 10 years. And uh, when I, when the family situation improved, financial situation improved, we moved to the a better location called Bab Shargi or the Eastern Gate. And this was next to the the Tigris River. It was a much nicer area. Okay. My parent uh, dealt with import of goods, cloth, pajamas, or shirts, and. Uh, they did well in that, and uh, continue to do that till till I escaped from Baghdad. Great. Um, what did your mother do? Was she a housewife? My mother was a house housewife. Yes. Great. So, what are sort of some of the daily activities of a housewife back in in that time and in that place? Well, we grew up in a family. There were seven brothers and one sister. Wow, big family. And my grandmother lived there too with us, and. Uh, Basically, she was uh, housewives. We had, even at uh, a low level of e economy, we had people, maids, or people used to come because they're, they came nor normally from Kurdistan, northern Iraq, they were very poor. So they, they lived in the house, they ate, and uh, the daily activity was to cook, take care of the kids, and uh, that's what professionals housewife did then. Excellent. Um, so what positive memories do you have um, of your of growing up there? I have lots of positive memories. Uh, you know, f first as family, family memory. We used to get together in uh, the festivals, uh, Passover uh, and Sukkot. We had a big sukkah built in, the, in our house. The houses in the old city of Baghdad were detached in th from three sides. Hmm. Yeah, the back and both sides. And they always there was a, an open court mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, the open court and the, and the rooms were around it, two floors. And uh, uh, that's how we, we grew up in that, uh, in, in Baghdad. I, you know, the family, I used to live in my mother's and father's bedroom. Mm -hmm. because we were so many of us, so we lived together. So the good memories I had with the family, and when I grew up, I still have some good memories. I had some good friends who were Muslims, Christians, and some of these Muslims I felt so 
attached and they were so sincere friends that I felt very secure with them. But the problem when they were not there and some bad Muslims, uh, you know, behaved badly against the Jews, that's where the fear. Also, I grew up in a passive society. Don't fight back. It will be bad for the Jews. Mm. If somebody hit you, don't fight back. Uh, I remember once I broke that, that law uh, when we moved in, in the better area. Uh, one of uh, new neighbors uh, moved next to us and I had a girl about my age. I was about 14. And at that time, you don't connect, you don't have dates, and you don't. So we looked at each other, and that's where it ended. And one day, I walk the street and I see her. Uh, uh, two Muslim boys were holding her. One was holding her, and was one fondling her. And I was uh, angry. I was, uh, I don't know if it's adrenaline or, or crazy. So I, I came and stopped them. And I said, uh, what are you doing? So they cursed me, the normal curse in Arab. Go away, you son of a dog, Ibn al-Kalb. Uh, so I punched one of them. And they left her, and one of them ran with, uh, ran with a knife after me. So I ran so fast, and I was lucky that one of the houses, somebody was coming out of the house, I pushed the door and I went there and I cried, they are trying to kill me. And I, was, I went up to the roof and from one roof to another and I escaped. Wow. So that's my first you know, encounter with death facing, I was really terrified. Yeah. Uh, again, we, the family was good, we had a lot of friends. Uh, we had some uh, even friends that are involved in politics, a member of parliament. Mm -hmm. And my, my father dealt with Muslims, and they were honorable the, in, in business. But again, we knew our status, where we are. You know, we know that we are not equal, and if something happens, we, you know, we have to, to, to combat that as you always bribe. They bribe, who to bribe? You bribe everybody. You know, you don't know who is coming in power. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, you continue to, you know, to survive. And that's how we survived. Wow. You mentioned the boys um, yelled at you in Arabic. What language did you speak at home? And what uh, language did Arabic. you speak outside? Arabic always? Yeah. First, first language was Arabic. Uh, we had sort of Judeo-Arabic, mm -hmm. a special dialect, the Jews, which closer to the Christian Arabic different than the Muslim spoken Arabic. But in school, we all studied the literal Arabic, the reading and writing in Arabic. Mm -hmm. So that's what we studied and learned. That's where I graduated my high school in Arabic. Uh -huh. Yeah. But this, the Jews had a, a dialect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the Jewish dialect. So how were Shabbat and the holidays observed in your home? Lovely. That's one of the great memories. We always, the family got together, I mean, uh, my brothers and all siblings on Shabbat, Friday night, uh, and especially on the holidays, like Passover. And I remember how my mother used to clean up all the house and the cutlery and the dishes and everybody come in to bake the matzah. We baked them at home. Oh, wow. The yeah, thin one, mm -hmm. all the family coming in, my aunts, and they bake it. And uh, I remember we used to read the Haggadah, which uh, read it in Hebrew, which I didn't understand, but always translated in Arabic in the Haggadah. Oh, wow, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Great. Um, and how was your relationship with um, other Arab neighbors prior to your immigration? Uh, in the old city, we were like a sort of a Jewish quarters, mm -hmm. but there was uh, a, a Muslim who was sort of the protector of that neighborhood. So uh, we had good relationship with that, uh, we, with that person, in that little lane of the old city of Baghdad. As we grew up, I went to, uh, in high school, I went to the American school for boys. 
and we had met many non-Jews, Christian, Armenian, Akkadian, and Muslims, and we became very good friends. We had good relationship. So tell me, what happened when your family had to leave? Well, I must tell you before I, how I left, because I was uh, graduated in 1948. So you finished high school? Then. I finished high school. And uh, my, my specialty when I want to come is to come to America. I was, uh, uh, I, I was excellent in science, algebra, chemistry, so I wanted to come to America. And I applied and I got three approvals one at USC, Washington, and Vermont universities. Then I applied to get a visa, and I got the visa. But after the 1948 war of Iraq and other Arab, uh, uh, Arab countries attacked Israel, they refused and they lost. So they became the government attacking the Jewish, uh, not attacking, but they enacting a law, Zionism is a capital punishment. And they arrested some of the people I know, some people, friends. And uh, I was frightened that they, they would be brought up, I don't know, about the to torture and the maltreatment uh, of these people. And uh, so I couldn't get out of Iraq. They, you needed an exit visa, and they wouldn't get, get, let me go. So in December of 49, I decided to escape. So I took the train from Baghdad to Basra and the road from there to go to Iran. I went with my younger brother and as upon arrival at the station, the secret police were waiting for us. We were with two other boys, four of us. Uh, so the guy called me, what is your name? So I said, Yusuf, Yusuf Sasson. Ah. You are Yehu Yehudi? I said, yes. Well, what are you doing in Basra? So I said, I have an aunt and I have a cousin who lives here. Yes? What is the name of your cousin? So I said, his name is Agababa. Oh, his face changed, big smile on his face. He said, I know him. I buy my arrow shirts from him. <laughs> you know? I knew that he got bribed in the secret police. His tone changed. He said, I know him very well, you may go. And he let us go, myself and my younger brother, who was three years younger. And we returned the other two back that to, 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 uh, to back that for, uh, you know, for the prison or whatever, they, to investigate. Wow, so they only let two of you in. Yeah. Then from Basra, it's a long story, I wrote about my escape, you know. Mm -hmm. But in two words, I was able to cross to Iran and from Iran, Israel sent an uh, airplane to pick us up. There was no benches. We had the wooden benches, no seat belts. We had no furniture, no clothes, nothing. No furniture, no luggage. So and from there, I went to Israel. I know you said you, you wrote about it, but could you give me a, a brief idea of what, it, what your escape was like? Well, the, we went in a boat, a small boat about 30 by 10 feet it has no motors, no beds, no toilets, no foods, to go to the journey from Basra to, to Iran, mm -hmm. which should have taken about three, four hours. So they have these smugglers. They made arrangement with the border police. They bribed them that we can cross. It happened to our bad luck that the tide was with us, but the wind was against us. Mm -hmm. This boat only worked with row and, and punting, mm -hmm. you know, the sticks. So as we left in the middle of the night, uh, we couldn't move far. So we went back to any uh, side, side rivers and, uh, and we stayed there overnight. And the next day, uh, we, we waited to change the, for the wind to change. And the, I was sort of a leader for the, there was about 16, 16 of us there. All being smuggled? All being smuggled, boys and girls. And one there was 13 years old boy. So I asked the guy dressed up in an Arab and, and was on the boat with the smugglers. 
And I asked him, when you go to buy, don't buy bulk food because they will recognize there's why he's buying one man buying so much food. So he went and came back after about an hour or so with bread, bread and dates and some cheese. And we are all hiding in this. The, 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 the smuggler made a false room, which is about two and a half feet high and covered with, with hay as if they are carrying hay to the farmers in the neighborhood. These both carry manure or hay, so they made a false room and we're all hiding in this, in this false room. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, the boys came out to go to the toilet outside, they were afraid one by one, and some cried. And I put up a stoic face you know, to encourage them that everything will be okay, not to frighten them. Then a boat, patrol boat passed by, with, they didn't de detect anything. And at night, uh, you know, the, the, the tide came with us again, and the wind. I call it the, my angels worked overtime yeah. to try to work it out. I joke sometimes when I talk about Anyway, we crossed, we've been able to cross uh, the, uh, the Shat al-Arab, that wide river. And we arrived and two men was going crazy what, what happened to us. And we made it. It's a miracle. We're lucky. Yeah. Wow. <sighs> what a trip. So how did you get then from there to the United States? Uh, we went from that area, then the, the, it was uh, uh, Haram Shahar in Iran. By, by train to Ahwaz, and from there, I stayed uh, two months more to help other coming in. I stayed in this city of Ahwaz in Iran uh, for about two months. And after that, I took the train, you know, organized by the, the Jewish community of Iran to go to Tehran, and the, we assembled all in the cemetery they, they had like bunch benches, and uh, and uh, Israel sent planes. I think I don't know if it was TWN, not TWN, some some planes, and we we went by plane. And on March second, I arrived to Israel. It was Purim, the first day of Purim. Oh wow! And in April, the first time I celebrated Passover as a free man. That's wonderful. What was that like? Nothing, you know, give me a freedom or give me death. That's the freedom what I felt at home. I went there, it took us to the refugee camps. And I stayed there for two weeks. And I didn't like it. I didn't want to be a victim. I didn't want anybody to feed me free food or tents. But, and after, but they gave me whatever I needed, you know, food. And, and after that, I said, I want to go to work, to find a job, to do something. And I left, and I learned that the uh, uh, the sukhnut or the labor. They sent us to learn how to to work with the land. To I uh, took a course in cutting stones to make stone walls. Wow. Yeah, and then to learn how to make uh, they call it hachsharat adamat. To take the stone from the land to make it cultivate. Yeah, then I joined the Israeli Navy. Uh, nine months, six months after in, in, in September. I served there for two and a half years. And I continued. I wanted to go to college after that. But, but I didn't have a chance because at the Israel at the time, they needed bodies in the army than education. Yeah. Wow. So I'm so fascinated by your, your story of your exodus. Um, did you get to bring anything with you? Did you have to just leave everything behind? Everything. Have, we um, were in my short, my short, <coughs> my clothes. I wear two, three shirts and two pants, three pants. That's all what we have. Then we walk with that. Because the smuggler didn't have any place, you know. We, we just didn't think about clothes. Just we were, we were running for our lives. Yeah. We thought about clothes or food or anything. We just 
And who was the smuggler? How did you get smugglers? The, there was the uh, the Jewish community that arranged these smugglers. You were know, the they're Muslims. Oh, no, 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 they're no, Muslims. they were Muslims, and uh, for a fee, they paid them money, and they did it as a as a business. After we were the last little boat to leave to Iran because it was discovered, as I mentioned to you, mm -hmm. about the secret police knew about youth are smuggling to go to Iran, so that that's, that path, that way was shut. Then they changed it to go to northern Iraq, where Khanaqin, the Kurdistan, and they were smuggling them there from there. Were you scared that the smuggler would turn you in? No, I didn't feel the... I was not frightened that this smuggler will turn because they'll be caught or... I didn't think at that time of, of them they're going to turn. I knew that they're being paid. Mm -hmm. And they pay them part now and part later when they deliver us. So I knew, I never thought that they're going to turn us. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing that you were, you know, the leader of this whole group that got smuggled. Yeah. How, did you keep in touch with the others? Actually, uh, when I wrote the story, one of our members of our synagogue came to me and we were watching a movie, The Last Jews of Baghdad. Mm -hmm. He said, I was the man, the 13 years old boy. Oh, wow. Yeah. His name is, um, what is his name? Aaron or something. I, yeah, I keep in touch with him sometimes. He came to see me. He said, I remember that, and I was the 13 years old boy. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. That's really amazing. So did you ever see your family again? My family came later. Uh, in 1951, there was a decree by the Iraqi government that Jews could leave officially, hmm. provided they don't go to Israel. So uh, Israel sent planes, and we will, they land to Cyprus. And from Cyprus, as if the destination was Cyprus, and from Cyprus, they came to Israel. So my mother and other brother came in through that. But when they, when they do that, they lost their citizenship, they lost their properties. My father and my brother stayed uh, because they had a the business and slowly they sold as much as they can secretly without being noticed. And they followed the same smugglers and they came to Israel, my father and my older brother who were the key in the business. My older brother was 20 years older than I am. Wow. And what about, you said you have seven siblings. Right. Where's everybody else? Uh, two of them came to Israel before, and one of them came to study at the Hebrew University. Right. Yeah. And he later became assistant professor, and you know, is, is still alive in, in Israel. The other one died or came after. And uh, everyone came in except one brother who went to Paris and then finally ended up to, uh, to come to Israel. Wow. So how did your family adjust to Israel? Uh, it's not bad because when my brother and father stayed, they were able to smuggle some money out. So we came in with some money. They bought a house. You know, like I came in as a homeless, penniless refugee. But when they came in, they were, you know, they bought a house and one of those lucky that were able to smuggle some money and bought a home. Wow. So what are some of your early experiences, particularly when you got to Israel and you were homeless and penniless by yourself? My, I was happy, first of all, that I am at home, finally. I'm at home. I spoke Hebrew. I learned in Baghdad to speak Hebrew. Had you learned at home or school? No, it was in the underground movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was, I learned to read uh, because of the synagogue. You learned the Torah, you learned to read. Uh, but in the underground, we learned how to speak Hebrew. And I learned basic Hebrew, how to speak it. So when I arrived to Israel, I had uh, already s was well versed in the Hebrew language. And uh, I went from one job to another, went to, to, uh, to the Navy. Uh, in fact, the, the time of my service at the Navy was the hardest part of my life. 
And the reason is I, the problem was with me because I grew up spoiled when the financial situation of my family improved and have servants. I was angry if he didn't give me cold water, the water was not cold enough. I was really a spoiled brat. But the Israeli army, you know, they teach you how to, you know, to be a part of a group and harsh. So I say it was the hardest, the worst time of my life, but it was the best. Mm. It really gave me the chance to know about life and uh, I grew up more appreciative and uh, I was able to, you know, to uh, adjust and live well. Yeah, I can't be spoiled in the army. No. <laughs> Although it's interesting that it was, that was the hardest time of your life after everything you went through and to get out of Iraq. Yeah, it's it's the it's a personal attitude, you know. If you have a here, you know that you live. You're, you know you're a, you're afraid of Muslim. You don't bother them. You learn to live with it. But being spoiled, I think it was the harshest. <coughs> Excuse me. So, how did you preserve any of your Sephardic heritage when you when you got to Israel? That wasn't hard. You know, we uh, continued to meet and continued uh, to have family. Uh, in fact, uh, at that time, I lost my religiosity. Mm-hmm. We grew up, all Jews in Baghdad grew up religious and, you know, practicing and observing. And I felt I don't need it anymore. I'm home, I'm among the Jews. So I. I lost the need to be very religious. Only when I left Israel to Canada, six years after, I went to study. I tried again to study in in Canada, but I couldn't also for the third time. In Israel, I couldn't back that. So, you know, I had no money, uh, no no support. Weather is new, the culture is new in English. So I dropped education and I said, I've got to you know, got to support myself, to learn how to make money and support myself. And I wanted to build up a family. So a couple of years after I got married and thank God blessed with a good wife, three children. Last June we celebrated 50 years. Wow, Mazel Tov. Thank you. That's so wonderful. So did you get married in Israel or did no, you? No, in Montreal. In Montreal, wow. So when did you go from Israel to Canada? In 1956. So you weren't in Israel? Six years. Six years. Mm-hmm. 1950 to 56. Wonderful. And why did you go to Canada and not to the U.S.? Uh, I couldn't get to the U.S. Canada was easy to, uh, to be. I was accepted at uh, McGill University, mm. and it was easy, so I went there. But then I realized I, I used to work during the day and sleep at night in the class. I used to, to work at night. I couldn't concentrate during the day. So I faced reality, and I accepted it, and I moved on. Wow. And what did you do? I uh, started selling real estate. Oh. Yeah. So at the time, it was very hard, and, and uh, slowly adjusted, and uh, this is a story by itself, too. So, But thank God I did well, grew up with kids. Then I realized, if I don't send the kids to Hebrew school, and we observed, and they will... You know, they will know nothing. Mm -hmm. So we did that. Even even at the beginning it was hard, but I did that and I'm very pleased. And did you tell them your story of of your accident? Some of the, yeah, later on, you know, it wasn't, you know, I lived with, I don't want to be a victim Mm -hmm. and I have hope, always hope and and I I don't want to be a victim. So I didn't tell them. Later on, you know, the grandkids said, well, tell us what's the story. So I wrote about the escape and wrote some background, the Passover in Baghdad. And actually, I published it in our synagogue. So a rabbi from Hillel at UCLA read it, and he invited me to speak to the students at Hillel. So I told the story. Great. And does your wife have a similar story? or? My wife was born in Bombay, India and also from Iraqi parents. Mm. And she came after the uh, Indian indep- India became independent. She went to England. Mm-hmm. She stayed there six years, and we met in Canada. Oh, how 
three oh days God. after she arrived oh. in a wedding. That's so nice. Do you have any other important memories or thoughts about your immigration or assimilation that you'd like to share? One of the things that, uh, you know, is the cap capacity to adjust to situations, you know? As long as I don't look in the past and dwell in the past, it was easy for me to, to succeed and be a happy person. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I am, what, what, I, what I missed in life is the education. I wanted to be a nuclear physicist. What I missed that is I got it in my children. I have two daughters. One is an MD and one a PhD psychologist. And my son is a PhD, a teacher in Kentucky. So uh, I see them and I said, this is the best dividend of any investment in my life. Mm -hmm. Thank God I have five grandkids, they all do well, all good students. And um, life is not a bed of roses, you, you know that. And uh, we face difficulty as we go and we adjust to it. And I say life is not a menu or a cart. You can't choose the best of everything as you sit in a restaurant. You get packages, you know. You have a wife, you have to deal with her. She has a problem with me, I have a problem. But we learn to balance it and adjust it. Same as the kids. So uh, we keep uh, with a smile and continue to live well. That's great. And well, thank God to my luck that I look at it as a the luck that I was blessed with rather than dwell in what is the, the unlucky situations. Yes, well it's so important to, to share your story because there aren't, there aren't very many people left who, who have such a great story to, to share with the world. So thank you so much for sharing. You're it. welcome. Yes. You're welcome. Wonderful. Thanks.